Welcome to episode 67 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Meyer, screenwriter and blogger over at sellingyourscreenplay.com. In this episode's main segment, I'm interviewing screenwriter John Gerald. It's a special episode. It's the first SYS podcast interview where I actually recorded it while being in the same room with the person I'm interviewing. I think it actually worked very well. It makes the interview much more conversational, which I like. When I'm doing interviews on Skype or telephone, there's this just like maybe a quarter second delay in the talking. And sometimes I feel like it's a little bit stilted. Sometimes I feel like we're kind of interrupting each other because of that little just microsecond delay. Um, and when we're in the room together, as you'll see, it just felt a lot more conversational and natural. We ended up talking for about three hours. So I'm going to break the interview up into three episodes that will come out over the next few weeks. We cover a ton of screenwriting topics from specifics about his career to just general screenwriting tips and, and how to survive as a screenwriter. So stay tuned for that. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread the word about the podcast, so they are very much appreciated. A couple of quick notes. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com screenplay.com slash podcasts and then just look for episode number 67 also if you want my free guide how to sell a screenplay in five weeks you can pick that up by going to selling your screenplay.com slash guide it's completely free you just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide how to write a professional log line and query letter how to find agents managers and producers who are looking for material it really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay just go to selling your screenplay.com slash guide also, a quick plug for the new SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high-quality professional script evaluation on your script. All the readers have experience reading for studios, production companies, agencies, or contests. The readers I've partnered with are the gatekeepers of the industry. They're exactly the same people who are going to be reading your scripts at the companies you submit to. The readers will evaluate your script on several key factors like concept and premise, structure, character, dialogue, and marketability. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend, and I'm also offering a bonus. If you get a consider and a recommend from two different readers on the same script, you get a free email and fax blast to my list of industry contacts. This is the exact same blast service I use myself to promote my scripts, and it's the same service I sell on the website. It's a great way to get your script into the hands of producers who are looking to make movies. Also, on the website, you can read a quick bio on each reader and pick the one who you think would be be the best reader for your script. So if you want a professional valuation of your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. I, um, just a quick few words about what I'm working on and doing. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. I attended the Robert McKee Story Seminar this past weekend. It was something I had always wanted to do, um, to go and do, and, and I'm glad I finally got the chance to do it. It is a little pricey. I think it was nearly $900 for three days. So here's my take on it. I'm very glad I did it. I would even consider doing it again. I would say, and I think you know, even Robert McKee would probably agree with this, if the money is an issue and you're wondering, gee, can I afford this or not, I would say um, you probably probably shouldn't do it. I mean, I did find it helpful and very inspiring, a lot of great information, but it's not one of those things that I think is mission critical to becoming a good screenwriter. Um, I haven't read his book. Um, I will go back and read the book for now for sure. Um, but what a lot of people at this seminar told me was that a lot of the same material was in his book. Obviously, hearing it in person is a different experience, but that's definitely a cheaper option. If you want to hear what um, Robert McKee has to say on story, definitely check out his book. Um, he's got a lot of great insight. The one big difference between him and many other script gurus like Sid Field or Blake Snyder is he's very much in tune with the screenwriter as artist 
He's not at all dogmatic, and he doesn't have a simple structure, which he recommends, like Blake Snyder's Beat Sheet. And this is what I found so refreshing about the experience, and this is why it was so inspiring. I think most of us, when we started on the long screenwriting journey, you know, we aspired to be artists and to write great scripts. And so some of the fire was rekindled by going to this seminar. It was rekindled in me by going to this seminar. And that's not a small thing, especially for a screenwriter whose most recent credit is a film called Ninja Apocalypse. There was also a ton of tactical tips, um, so I don't want to make it seem like it was just all inspirational. Lots of tactical tips. I mean, a lot of great stuff on um, writing dialogue, characters, you know, text, which is the dialogue subtext. Um, just a lot of just tactical tips on, on scene, I would say a lot of scene level tactical tips on screenwriting. The last day we actually watched Casablanca from start to finish and at the end of each scene he would actually pause the film and we would discuss what we had just seen and he would really go through it you know almost line by line and this is an incredible exercise to do even by yourself but doing it with someone as experienced as Robert Key is very interesting and educational he knows a ton about screenwriting he knows a ton about Casablanca he's seen it a million times so hearing his thoughts on it and seeing the movie seeing a scene having him pause it and then really break down the dialogue what we've just seen is a pretty interesting experience a lot of really educational experience anyway so overall I really did enjoy it and um, and I felt like I got a lot out of it one quick note before we get into the main segment. John recently wrote a book called Tough Love Screenwriting. I will refer to it often in the interview. I'll link to it um, in the show notes. If you haven't read the book, I do highly recommend it. There are a lot of topics in the interview from the book, so reading the book before listening to the interview will give you some context or going and reading the book and then coming back and listening to the interview again. You shouldn't have any problem following along if you haven't read the book, but again, I definitely, I'll link to it in the show notes. I definitely would recommend it if you haven't already read the book. Go check it out. It's, it just covers a wide range of topics, and um, John has a lot of insight, many, many years of experience and, and a lot of insight into the industry. Anyway, here is the interview. Welcome, John, to the Sound of Screenplay Podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show. I'm very excited to be here. This so let's go ahead and just get into some questions. I recently read your book, um, and so I have a bunch of questions that will relate to that, and then we'll probably even go outside of the book. Sure. Um, I usually start out by asking interview guests to just kind of tell us how they broke into the business. You cover that pretty well in the book, so I'm just going to refer people to your book to get some of those insights, some of the inside scoop on that. But I would like to go back. Something that you didn't cover in great detail is taking us back sort of before you broke in as a screenwriter, even before you got your first agent. What sort of inspired you? Why did you want to be a writer? Like even just take us back to, to your childhood that made you think why you know, right. this it, it's very funny I'm not one of those Spielberg guys who like at age 8 I'm making super 8 movies uh, I literally I worked uh, in radio as a senior in high school on a real commercial station um, something the equivalent of like uh, The Sound today or Jack you know FM mm -hmm. so as a senior in high school that was pretty big shit and um, basically I met a guy there who was a program director really smart guy who ultimately ended up in LA uh, working for KROQ, but I was a freshman at uh, Oregon, and I got a call from the guy. He said, "Listen, uh, I figured it out. We're gonna do film." And I was like, "Great, let's do film." I had no idea what that was, etc. But radio, you know, is a very limited. Even back then, it was a very kind of limited world. And he got this idea, like, "Look, we're gonna we're gonna do film." So I was like, "Great!" So I immediately started applying to film schools. So it was it was really, I mean, it was really. Blind faith, take the leap, hey, this is my, my buddy, we're tight, yeah, shit, we'll lick this, let's do it. So I applied to all these film schools, I got into NYU, uh, started going to NYU, incurring huge student loan debt, like everyone else, and um, ultimately what was interesting is, I didn't really have any, you know, I didn't have any great passion for film, per se, I liked movies like other people, but I, I just, someone put the idea in my head, it sounded cool. So I went to NYU and that's really when the learning process started and, and all that stuff. So I really can't claim to be like one of those kids. Yeah, I was in the crib and they handed me taxi driver and I started, you know, it, it wasn't like that. Uh, ultimately, he didn't get into film at all, which, you know, I guess that's logically where the story's going to go. Mm -hmm. But once I hit NYU and really got into it, you know, that kind of kind of took hold, you know, and that's it. Were, were you a good writer? I hear a lot of screenwriters, successful screenwriters say, you know, in their early, whether it be, you know, even junior high, as early as elementary school, they really liked writing, they liked reading, they were into stuff. Were you a good, I mean, were you a good student? Were you a good writer? Uh, not a great high school student. I was too busy listening to Ozzy and Black Sabbath and Van Halen's Fair Warning to 
really give a shit. Um, but I was a good writer. I wrote for the school uh, newspaper. Eventually they gave me my own column, uh, which was suitably twisted, as you can imagine. So I had always shown a good raw ability to write. So I had a raw talent. And what I realized at NYU, by the time I graduated, I understood I didn't have the money to direct. You know, I didn't, I was pretty working class. I didn't have any connections. So the only way to get above the line was to write. I basically trained myself as a cinematographer. And then I realized, dude, you know, in New York City at that time, you know, by 1990, there was no work there. And if you were going to go union, that's like 15 years before you touch the camera. So I was like, well, how can I get above the line? I can't direct. I'm not going union. And really writing was the only tool at hand to get above the line. So I knew I had a raw talent, and if I worked super, super hard at it, I might be able to become a decent writer. And that's exactly the way it went. It wasn't like I had, was predestined to write. I knew I had a, a raw talent. If I busted my ass, maybe I could turn it into something. And that's really the thought process. Okay, okay, great. Um, one thing, again, in your book, you talk about getting this first agent, and that was at least sort of at least inspirational enough for you to move to LA and kind of get your career right. going and that thing. There seemed to be a misconception. I get this question a lot. I get people asking me. There seemed to be a misconception for people trying to break into the business that once I get that first agent, it's all smooth sailing. And maybe we can get your thoughts on that because it definitely, you got your first agent um, through happenstance, which I think is a lot of people's sort of first things, but it yeah. didn't seem like it was all smooth sailing once you had your first agent. I mean, essentially you're exchanging one dictator for another. You, you're like, you're an unknown, so you need an agent. Once I get an agent, I'm going to be fine. Then you get the agent, and now you have other problems, like getting them to pay attention, writing material they can sell. So it's, it, not only is it not smooth sailing, essentially you're just inheriting a, a little bit higher class group of problems. Um, especially, you know, nowadays it's, it's very different where managers are, are doing a lot of the servicing that agents used to do. Back then, the agent was pretty much it. Um, but now you have a whole new host of concerns. You've got to you've got to put one down the middle. Give it, it. Say they sign you over a script that's really good, but they they can't sell it or whatever. But they see some talent there. You got to prove yourself all over again. And and that's having an agent's good because that means you have one person among ten million strangers who actually gives a shit whether you live or die, kind of, as opposed to zero people. But it's, it really actually turns up the, you know, the responsibility you have to generate new material. Because really, I mean, and it took me years to learn this, the agent can only work with what you give them. So, you know, I was one of those guys, I was young, super fired up, and I was like, hey, I already wrote one good script that, you know, we came very close to selling. Um, you know, let the job offers roll in, bro. You know, and it, it's like, dude, one good script that didn't sell is not going to get you a studio writing assignment. I hear this a lot now with my students. They, a lot of them want to be TV writers because you know there's more money in TV now. It's it's really come up in terms of quality, um, and they you know they want to get into a writer diversity program or like you know the Fox Writer Program, this or that, thinking that that's a gateway right onto a staff. I mean, staffing jobs are brutal, man. I mean, it's they're not giving those jobs away. I have friend, I have a friend that was Emmy nominated. Um, you know, it was like. There, I think there's this mythology that somehow, like, to me, the odds of selling a spec, even in this kind of marketplace, are markedly higher than getting a staffing job. I have an Emmy-nominated buddy of mine. He went three years without getting a staffing job and then only got staffed because of the showrunner was a good friend. Those are the plum jobs, man. And there's really good writers with proven track records in TV. It, you know, for someone who's 24 to think they're going to, like, write a spec uh, two and a half men, and suddenly they're on the staff of True Detectives, it's just, it's a little far-fetched. And of course, I take every opportunity to tell them that, yeah, yeah, uh, try yeah, to get yeah. them back to reality. For sure. So you talk about, um, in your book, getting the right agent. And, you know, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. I mean, obviously, for someone that's starting out, any agent is probably better than no agent. But yes. um, once you start to move on, how can you identify the right agent for you as a writer? Well, you know, I think in the book, it kind of covers my personal, you know, ups and downs of that. I really think it comes down to the agent getting you, which means they understand not everybody's going to be a giant, broad, rather simple idea guy, a J.J. Abrams perhaps, you know, someone who's good with big, broad strokes if you don't look too closely at the details. Um, not everyone's like that. Some people are very idiosyncratic. They're more character based. They're more so. It's really finding an agent who sees what you are as a writer and sees where they could plug that in. And that, for me, when I got signed to Endeavor, that was really the turning point. But, um, you know, my agent understood. He, he read uh, 
he read my new spec, and then, which is a little darker character piece, and he read a horror franchise I'd auctioned, and he said, I get it, you can write, um, as opposed, you know, there's a lot of writers, they have one great script, one great idea, and that's kind of it. And that's, hey, that's good too. But he could see I had some range I could write, so then he just said, like, you know, we'll get you working. It'll probably take a year, but we'll get you out there. And, he, and what he was great at, and what Endeavor was great at at that time was, figuring out how to get you into the specific place you needed to go, the rooms that would really be open to what you brought to it. Um, so I was very fortunate to have that kind of agent. Not every agent, not every manager is gonna be that precise or have the luxury of, of taking their time like that. Um, I think end of the day, you need, you know, look, what you said is totally right. Someone's better than no one. And if that's a stepping stone manager or agent, that's fine. And the thing writers have to remember is you can always leave your representation. Uh, that's not a problem. The big thing is if you, you know, one thing I will say, it, getting signed by a partner at a major agency as a new writer is not a great thing because they're not going to service you. The, you what you want is a, a, someone who's kind of where you are. An up-and-comer, say a junior agent at WME is awesome because they're building their career while you're building your career. So it's, it's the huge guy with big money clients you know, you end up kind of, being, you're not paying the, you know, you're not paying the rent on that building, bro. You're, you're just kind of hanging on. So what was great for me is I went to a brand new agency, which became really big, but also had an agent who was on the come too. And so it was a really nice fit. So I think you can get lost in the name game with agents and managers. Um, just remember, it's not, ultimately the agency doesn't matter. The agent or the manager matters because that's your point person who's going to try to steer you where you need to go. And that's really essential. It really is. You mentioned in the book too, um, and you just mentioned as we're as we're talking. When you started out, you had an agent. And the agent would do a lot of the duties of a manager. Maybe you can just tell us what you get nowadays from your agent versus what you get from your manager. Um, I, I think this is. And I've talked to a bunch of friends about this. I, I think it's markedly different than pre-crash, you know, pre-08. I mean, really, agents, especially I'm at WME, and it's a huge agency. It's a global force, uh, and they're they're dealing with packaging and much bigger scope things, their, their focus is not the 10 percenter, the average you know, working class, middle class writer like myself. They're, they're dealing with bigger stuff. So you don't get service like, like when I first went to Endeavor, you were being actively serviced in the old school sense. What I find now is it's the manager that's really doing what the agent used to do. And the agent, you know, it's, it, I mean, everyone has a different take on this. If you have a great agent, you want to keep them. But essentially that agent is kind of there when it's time to do the deal now, as opposed to the manager, in my experience, is the one actually beating the brush, seeing what's out there, open assignments, you know, making the connects. You know, it's a little unrealistic to think, uh, you know, my agent is a partner at uh, WME. So, you know, they're dealing with big, big, big people. So, you know, the idea that that guy is going to be, you know, beating the bricks for me, it's just a little, you know, it's a little ridiculous. So that, I think that's where the manager has come in because that's the person who services you. And really, like I said, it doesn't matter where they're at, what their company name is. Do they understand who you are as a writer? Are they really giving you 100%? Are they keeping their eyes open for the things that would be great for you? And you got to remember, there's a lot less development work now than there ever was um, before. I mean, before the crash, you, know, you could make a very good living as a middle class writer. Now those jobs are fewer and further between, more competitive. Uh, it's, it's really a buyer's market for studios and producers where they can, I've heard all sorts of stories of bake-offs and, and you know, having competing writers work on, it's, it's really in their hands now, which is a little unfortunate, um, but you need someone to steer you through all that white noise and just get you in the room so you can do what you do and try to get that job. Mm -hmm. so, so right now, um, with a William Morris agent, you could almost just, I mean, you want that, that prestige of William Morris agency even though he's not really doing anything for you. I mean, essentially, you could just have a lawyer negotiate your deal. Absolutely. And, um, and I mean, I have a long-term relationship there. Obviously, I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, one of their top drawer clients. The, the advantage for me is with a long relationship there, being a producer screenwriter, I can get a hold of them and say, uh, like with the book, for example, you know, I know that if I go to my agent, he'll send it to the head of publishing in New York, and they'll take a look at it and tell me what they think. I have an open door there. Um, for any material I ever write. And if I write a big money spec, that's great too. Um, but it, it's good to have that scope of influence. Uh, I, worked, I, worked, I wrote a book a couple of years ago, a very famous Chinese mobster from the 70s. 
And it was great because when we got it to WME, they covered it immediately realized it was kind of like an Asian Goodfellas. And literally in, in what, five days time, they had it with Justin Lin to see if he was interested. You know, that's fucking awesome, you know, to reach that. Ultimately he passed, but the point is, you write a good book about an Asian Goodfellas, real life story, and you get it to them, and they have the connections to go right in at the big boy level. You're not down here going through, oh, maybe a CE likes it, and he gives it to a VP. You know, that could, you can grow old waiting for that. The idea that you call and they go, hey, let's get into Justin Lin, see what he says. You know? And you, you use the word, you keep using the word service, and agent, this manager is you know, not going to, the top agent is not going to service. Maybe you can just define for yeah. us and what exactly does that mean, service? Sure, service okay. means, you know, that they're actually working on your career. I mean, it's a combination of factors. It's, it's seeing what the open jobs are, um, finding out the new executives that might be good to meet with, who to send your material to, even if just sending it cold, just to build relationships. Um, you know, back in the day, there was kind of, there was more impact with that kind of stuff. Now it's like, it's interesting, because back in the day, you took a lot of generals, and you met people face to face, and, and now the generals are scaled back. Largely, I mean, my feeling is because they're unnecessary. I mean, look, if you're up for a job, they're gonna get you in there. But, you know, the idea of building relationships face-to-face -face in the room has kind of taken a backseat to expediency. And this contraction where uh, branded writers are going to have kind of the pick of the litter. And it's weird for you to even think that way, but, you know, J.J. Abrams is a branded writer. Uh, there are writers that their name moves a project. I'm clearly not one of those writers. Um, but it, it's just interesting, when you're being well-serviced, that means someone, despite a ton of no's, despite they're not right for it, despite executives' complete and total apathy <laughs> towards your screenwriting, uh, they stay at it. And, and when I was at Endeavor, you know, one agent in particular took, uh, took an interest in, in making my career, and she, she basically, you know, kicked a few doors in against, you know, and long story short, I had written a script uh, for Regency, which was a really cool script, but I was a really young writer, and interestingly, they, you know, Regency seemed unhappy with it. And I, you know, like every young writer, I was racking my head like, I don't know, I think this is good. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm an asshole. Maybe I totally fucked it up. Um, but, you know, I felt like, I think this is a lot better than they're saying. Because, you know, they were really, I mean, it was, it was bad enough, you know, these are the old school uh, <laughs> producer, producerial tricks. Uh, I got a, literally got a call on Thanksgiving from one of the producers. There were four of them. And they called me, I was in Arizona at my folks place, I got a call and the producer, I'm, I'm like a Pat Riley guy, like I, I don't mind people like, let's get fired up, let's do this, come on John, suck it up, yeah, great. It's the silent disappointment that really kills. So I got this call and literally the producer said, John, I'm very disappointed in your draft. You know, for me that was just like, oh, knife in the, on Thanksgiving, knife in the heart. So obviously I was the monkey in the middle, a lot of times this happens at a studio. Two producers wanted one movie, the company wanted another movie, you're the monkey in the middle. So each side is kind of trying to manipulate what that draft is. So he called me on Thanksgiving, surgical strike to kind of, you know, blow me out a little bit, get me moving the project to his side. And the whole time I'm thinking, this script really is not that bad. I, I know there's good stuff in here. Well, this agent in Endeavor, it was Adriana Albergetti. Um, she read the draft and said, these guys are fucking crazy. So. She called him up and said, you guys are fucking crazy. I'm going to use this as a sample. And they're like, whatever, use it. Um, so she sent that in to Warner's. Warner's needed someone to come in and save Romeo Must Die. Uh, they winnowed it down to four writers. And I made the cut to four based on the draft that Regency was telling me I had fucked up. So she knew it was good, gave it to Warner's. They went, this is great, get this guy in here. And then basically, it was a very interesting job. They didn't want to spend a ton of cash. They wanted someone young and hungry. And they just said, look, each of the four writers, you're not even coming into the studio. Fax us a couple, you know, fax us a couple pages of how you would fix Romeo Must Die. And so I later talked to the executives because I got the job. And these guys faxed in. You know, people phoned it in. They faxed in like one, one and a half pages. And I, you know, I put together five rock hard, bulletproof pages. And like, if you laid them out, it was like one page, one page, one, five solid pages. And I got the job like that. You know, they, they went soft. And they, one thing I would say for young writers is, if that door opens even that much, you've got to kick that fucking thing in. Do not go soft. They're not giving this shit away. They're not giving the money away. 
So these guys went soft at the finish line. I just dunked on all of them. And what's fascinating is, ultimately, that five pages, I don't think we really used much of what I had posited there. But when I talked to the executive, who was Greg Silverman at the time, he's much bigger up at Warner's now, um, Greg said, well, when we read them all, even though we didn't want to use a lot of your specific ideas, we saw that you understood the movie, the construction of the movie, and what the movie was about. And so really, it, when you think of it, it's kind of funny, like, okay, we're not going to use any of those ideas, but we can see from the way you think that you can fix this, and that's exactly what happened. So it was really, you know, Adriana, you know, refusing to just walk the company line and using her own sense. Now we're back to, you know, what's good servicing of a client. She knew it was a good script, that I was a good writer, that I, that I could handle it and refused to just settle with, oh, you know, Regency thinks this is shit. Uh, she made her own mind up and my career subsequently blew up because of that. Mm -hmm. hey, and by the way, God bless you find an agent as good as Adriana Alberghetti that's out there. But remember, at that time, she wasn't the superstar that she is. I mean, she... She was on the come too, young and hungry, and now we're back again to she understood me as a writer. She understood the projects I'd be good for, what was in my wheelhouse, and so you know if you can find someone like that and that's not interested in immediate payoff, and that was a huge thing at Endeavor at the time. When Endeavor started, the idea was we don't need you to make money right away. I talked about that in the book a little bit. You get a window. Hey, we'll give you six months, a year, whatever, to see where this goes, and Endeavor was great about that. They were like, we'll get you working, don't worry about that. Just you know, put your best effort into it, and it paid huge dividends. Yeah, you know? yeah. I want to back up just a little bit. Um, you talk about this project. Was it New Regency? Or, uh, yep. Okay. So back that up. I mean, you're developing a script for them. Your agent sends it somewhere else. Were they paying you to write this script? The well, the script had the script had essentially it was very fun and classic. The script was done, and I had done two passes, and I was just getting sodomized by everybody. Like I just fucked somehow. I just fucked the pooch on this. Um, at that point, she called the executive in charge at Regency and said, you guys just don't know what you're talking about. I'm using this as a sample. And I went, fine, use it as a sample. And so she used the sample. <laughs> I got the job on Romeo and you know, I saved that movie in two weeks. It was shooting two weeks after that. And so what was really funny is uh, they, were already, they, they couldn't wait for me to finish my steps at Regency so they could fire me. Um, they, were, they were so excited about firing me, all right? So then... It came out in the trades that I was doing Romeo Must Die, and suddenly they had a, what? Uh, I remember at the premiere, this was hilarious, at the actual premiere of Romeo Must Die, um, you know, it was a full house, it was just, it was awesome. It was a surprise hit movie, Village Theater in Westwood, all your screenwriting fantasies coming true, and half the crowd was hip hop because of the movie, half was film business. I remember after the movie, this same executive from Regency came up to me and said, uh, oh, so that's what you were working on? And then it opened like six million dollars on a Wednesday, and I never heard another fucking word from that guy. But the point is, I don't want to fuck my ex girlfriend anymore, but I don't want you fucking her either. That was basically, oh, we got another job from this script. So it was very sadistic in a way, and I suppose that's just some of the politics of it. But really, the the key is an agent, a representative, who said, no, fuck you. The guy's good, and we're gonna make this work. So you know, again. Count your lucky stars if you meet someone who's willing to go to the mat for you like that. It completely changed my life. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, one thing I don't hear you talking about, um, and the, I've had one manager, I've had a couple of what I would consider really lousy agents, but one of the things that the manager did for me, more than open any doors, was he was real good with development. Just he would read my material, give me notes, right. and he was an ec really excellent at that. And I don't hear you saying any of that. Is that just not the relationship you have with them? But is there that back and forth? That's very interesting. Um, I've ideas? never had that. I mean, every agent, manager, managers tend to, I think, develop more. And you've touched on something which is key too, which is, well, how do you know if they're a good developer? You feel like the guy's instincts are right, that, that he's helped you. I went into it from the start, from the moment I went to Endeavor, I never had a, a relationship about development. Um, I kind of have, everyone does it differently. Writing is a different process. For me, my, you know, my stuff doesn't leave the house until I feel like it's pretty much bulletproof. So I never had those discussions. I think if I had shanked one or it wasn't right, um, someone would have said something. But it wasn't contingent on them helping me to develop. They kind of assumed I could get the job done. Same with my managers. Again, everyone's different. Some people like um, having outside feedback from managers and agents, which can be very helpful. Um, so I, I don't really have a preference. I just know I tend to be so type A about it that by the time it leaves the house, it's, it's screwed in pretty tightly. Um, but I assume if it had sucked, 
someone would have told me. I hope they, <laughs> I hope they would. Have. Sure, sure. <laughs> you know, there was a story in the book about you know, the first script that I sold. My agent and I had a very different take on was it ready to go out or not, which was detailed in great, great length in the book. But it's a really fine line. Young writers, especially, you don't want to change anything. You know, when it, it's such a monumental task to write a screenplay and write one well that the last thing you want is people telling you to change shit. Th this is being a writer. I, I think as a professional, you learn to surf that, take it less emotionally, less personally. But it, what's really important is that you listen to what they're proposing the changes are from as objective a place as possible. But don't just knee jerk assume that they're wrong because you're the writer, which I did for many years as a young writer. In that story in particular, I said, let's give it, I, let's slip it to a producer, see what they say, and they ended up buying the script. But the agent had been right. We did then change the third act that the agent said we need to change <laughs> anyway. So, you know, it's really important to listen to the feedback, even if you disagree with it. You gotta remember, especially if you're a younger writer, these people do this for a living. They've been doing it a long time. So they, their notes do have real value. It's easy just to go, you don't know, man, I'm the writer. And believe me, I did that for years. It's, it's really about, hey, you know what? If you don't agree with any of their notes, that's great. But if you give them an honest listen, at least you have the opportunity to incorporate them. And, and I tell this to so many people, dude, other people's great notes, you get credit for it. They don't put their name on the script. When they say, hey, change this character, and you do, who go, wow, that's great, you get the credit for it. So I think that's really a thing young writers especially uh, need to deal with, which is, hey, man, it's okay to listen to feedback. Don't get on your hind legs right away. Hey, ultimately, if you think it's really fucking up the script, you take a stand. But, man, you'd be shocked at how many good notes you can throw away out of this sense of, like, you know, I'm the writer, and you're trying to fuck it up. It's kind of a cop-out, ultimately. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so let's move in. It seemed like, and your book was not necessarily in chronological order, no. so so I might be misreading some of what, oh, I'm, okay, what, sure. what I'm, so, so correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, but it seems like there's three distinct periods of your career. There was the period where you moved to LA before you sold that first script, so that was like six months, and you detail that quite a bit in the yes. book. At the end, you kind of go through that rough six months. Then there's this second period um, where you had sold that first script, but it was seemed to be before Romeo Almost Died, which yes. kind of propelled. So then there was the third period where once Romeo Almost Died, it was a big big hit and your name was on it so that kind of took your career to yeah that's so about right yeah. okay, so there's a three period so I want to go back and talk about that second period which is basically between you know before Romeo's died but after selling your first script and, okay. um, and I mean I include myself in this I mean when I was starting out I had this idea that if I could just get that one first sale it, it would be smooth sailing, much like you know, you think it would be, <laughs> right, right. be smooth sailing. Right. And um, you know, as I said, this this what I would say was the most hazy in the book was I wasn't sure. Like you, there's stories of you still driving your Volkswagen, '66 Volkswagen Bug. You're still living in the um, apartment in Venice, 400 square foot apartment. You're still eating tacos, but it's 40 nights in tacos. But as yet, it's after um, you know that first sale. And I think it's so important for people to hear that and realize that you know it's not getting that first agent, it's not getting that first sale. There's uh, a screaming career is a marathon so maybe you can talk about the struggles after selling that first script yeah just you know how hard you had to work to actually get make a living at it not just uh, I, I think you're I think you're dead on I mean I think one of the big misconceptions is that it's ever smooth sailing I mean I think if you get over the wall if you're a Kiba Goldsman God forbid and and you're at the point where you're getting hired no matter what I suppose then it's smooth sailing but for 99.9 percent of all writers, it's never smooth sailing. You, you know, you're self-employed, it's work for hire. Um, and I had spent enough time, it took me seven years from the time I started to the time I optioned my first script that got made. So that's seven years of living, you know, the low life, which I had no problem with because I stripped my life down so there were no expenses. I didn't have a car payment, I had my bug. I lived in a 400 square foot bungalow, it was 450 bucks a month. I had gone, it was like a stock car. You take the seats out, you take the dash out, you know, there's a roll bar, the steering wheel, speedometer, and the gear shift. So I was totally good with that, man, and, and that allowed me to persevere that long. Even after I started making real money, um, at that point I had experienced enough poverty, so the last thing I wanted to do was get stupid about it. That sound is my cat, by the way, in case you're wondering. Um, it, it, was, it was really like, 
I don't claustrophobia is too strong, but it was like, keep your head low in the hole and keep working, bro. This is not, this one check doesn't mean, uh, I told you the story before we started. You know, when Romeo Must Die got made, I was talking to my dad, and I just said, you know, wow, this is great. I finally got a studio movie produced, and my dad goes, you know what? This is great, John. When you boil it down, you've made like a buck fifty an hour for the last eight years. And it's really true. Like, yeah, you get a check at one point, but when you go through the hours you've spent, it's it hour for hour, it's not really a, a great thing. So it, it was a conscious effort, like keep everything downsized, don't get goofy, don't get hillbilly rich. But I mean, dude, I've seen numerous friends back in the day buy the, the big car, do, do shit that was just out of their means. One check does not a career make. And uh, that's what I found out was like just, Put the money away, keep your head down, and, and follow this lead. And, that, and that's exactly what I did. And I was very happy. I knew that when I, when I upsized my life, you can always, you know, when you start here and then it starts to open up, you can't really get the genie back in the bottle. So I knew once I moved and bought a home or did real adult things, I would never be able to go back to that. So I, that 10 years, I just rode that horse all the way in, man, as, as best I could. And the money, you know, the money is illusory. It's great to finally make money with your writing, and it's a it's a satisfaction unlike any other. Um, but believe me, the problems are just kind of starting, man. You know, you're, you've got, you're exchanging one dictator for another. Now you have to deal with, can I keep writing? Is this assignment, do they like this assignment? Will that help me get more work, or do they, do they actually hate it? it? Am I gonna get that movie produced? or not. Will I go into arbitration and get credit on something I clearly wrote or not? So it, it's always a bunch of higher class problems, but you're dead right. You never really find a, you know easy street. It's an illusion. And, and my advice to screenwriters is save your money. If you're lucky enough to make money, save it. Because especially now, the business is harder every year. And this whole idea like buying the sports car, it's like a bad Cinemax movie from the 80s, right? He buys the Porsche, moves to the beach, don't do it, man. Put the money away. Put yeah, money yeah, yeah. And maybe you could just elaborate a little bit that you know, what kind of jobs you're getting and how much money were you making and how much time was between the jobs? Would you end up with one or two jobs a year? You make 30000 here, 60000 here. So, I mean, what did those seven years of, of toil kind of really look okay, like? Okay, the seven years, so that's the years before Romeo. Correct. Okay, so those are the leanest years and I was really, you know, doing it hand to mouth. I mean, uh, finding a lot of the work on my own. My agent wasn't particularly helpful because for, for a number of reasons. That's also outlined in the book. I wasn't setting the town on fire with my writing. You know, you, you can only beat one or two good specs to death. You can only mail them around town and wallpaper Hollywood with your best efforts so many times. So I wasn't giving her great new material to work with. That's one. Um, so two, you get into the room. There's people that have done more, etc., etc. So I was really piecing it together, man. I mean, I uh, a friend of mine's dad had a company. I ended up writing a movie for them for like, God, what was it like? Uh, I don't want to say 15 grand. I, some Israeli producers contacted me to save a movie. That was a horrifying experience. Those are the classic Israeli producers that speak perfect English when they're pissed. Otherwise, they only speak broken English and Israeli to each other. It's, it's, it's when they get upset that suddenly it's like the king's English. That was a hoot, that was a great. But you know, 15 grand here, 20 grand there. Uh, an $8,000 polish, which actually is a rewrite, but they're calling it a polish to pay you less. It was really hand of mouth. So I made just enough money every year to survive having zero expenses and living at the poverty level. Yeah, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it to, you know, it'd be very hard for me to say, oh yeah, do it, man, it's great. You're making like 15 grand a year. And, you know, it, it's not great, it's hard, but, um, by any means necessary. That's really how I thought of it. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay in this long enough to turn the corner. It was really a point of pride, and that meant a lot of Taco Bell and and a lot of not having. I think probably the the low point financially was uh, growing up. I, I loved one Marvel superhero, which was Iron Man. Now you gotta remember this is 30 years before Iron Man came out. So the one collection I had put together of comics as a kid, I had Iron Man one through like 250 bag. Uh, in mint condition. I'd had this for, I don't know, 15 years or whatever. So uh, I got a bunch of stuff sent to me in LA. It was in storage. My Iron Man collection was among them. I hit this one month. My total all in monthly was $750. That would cover what I needed to survive. And I just didn't have any work. I didn't have any money. Uh, and essentially, I put an ad in like the penny saver back then for my Iron Man collection. A guy came over and he bought it for like 
like 700, I think it sold for 750 bucks. It had like Fantastic Four, 48, 49, 50 in there. I mean, it was, it was awesome. Uh, Iron Man number one, I mean, it was awesome. Uh, but I just had to sell it to the guy, I just had to let it go. And uh, it hurt, man, it hurts like you're selling off your child, the last remnants of your childhood. Um, but that $750 kept me in the game and ultimately to make millions of dollars later. So, you know, you just, it, by any means necessary, do what you have to do. It hurt like hell to, to tell my mom, yeah, I had to, you know, I had to sell my, my Iron Man collection. But in the scale of things, Hey, it got me where I was going. Help get me keep the drive alive. That's really the, the I'd be, take. I'd be curious, when was that in this seven year period? Just so people have a sense of that. That would have been probably 95, 96. So maybe two years before Endeavor. So in other words, if I hadn't done that and kept it alive for another month, I wouldn't have gotten to Endeavor, which then is the puzzle piece that, that moves you forward. So it was very guerrilla. And, and, and believe me, this wasn't like trust fund rebel stuff. This is like, we don't have enough food. We don't, we don't have money. It was real, uh, educated white <laughs> poverty. You know what I mean? It's great to be college educated, have 50 grand in student loans and be eating 49 cent tacos at, at Taco Bell. It's a wonderful feeling. <laughs> but it was just to be, just to be absolutely clear, it was after that first script sale. Oh yeah. That, that was, you know, we're back to what you're saying about, uh, you know, smooth sailing. Uh, it was like, I, I sold the script, which at that time appeared like it was going to get made. So I was a yes or no away from a $350,000 check. So we had a huge star attached, at Warner's, it was all looking good. And I literally, you know, I was young, so I literally waited by the phone that day to hear, you know, if it was a yes or no at the studio. Um, it came back no. Uh, so I went from the imaginary $350,000 the car I was going to buy my dad, the party I was going to throw, that kind of stuff. Um, and in conjunction with that, I also got a writing assignment at Silver Pictures, which was like, it was like a small thing, like 55 grand. Um, but those two things happened and then nothing. They both died, which is very common. You know, it, it, it's a no. Uh, the development deal is over. And so then it was right back to, I mean, it literally my career went like this, went like that. And that's what people are prepared for. It's, it does not go like that for most, you know, ninety nine percent of people. It was like, hey, this is awesome. Oh fuck, now what? And and then it was that that dead zone of you know, you're on the desert floor. Can you make it to water? Mm -hmm. um, and the, like I was saying before we started, I, it's got to be tougher on young writers now because the economy is different. Things are more expensive. You have more expenses. Your gadgets, your cell phone. Uh, for me, it was it was a very guerrilla undertaking, which fits my personality. But it's not for everyone. I mean, I, I really do think the idea of having a job, like you were talking about, having a job, an IT job, a programming job, while you're screenwriting, could be a huge, huge load off your back. Because you know you're not gonna starve. For me it was, hit the three-pointer at the buzzer, or go home. And by the grace of God, you'll notice I'm not taking any credit <laughs> for this at all. You know, I got pushed out of bounds and just heaved it up and it went in and, and by the grace of God. But there's easier ways. I mean, in retrospect, you know, having a job that you enjoy to, to keep a roof over your head and take that pressure off would have been huge. So there's just different ways to do it, you for know? Sure, for sure. So um, I just want to go back. I mean, my blog is literally called sellingyourscreenplay.com. So I always like to dig in a little bit. You said there were these sort of lean times where your agent wasn't getting you work. You were finding work. I yeah. mean, as an example, maybe you can go into how you were finding work. You just mentioned these Israel producers. How did those Israel producers actually find uh, you? I had met a, oh God, how did I, I had met a director who did a ton of low budget action. I can't even remember how I met the guy. Um, and then he had this thing coming up. We kind of hit it off. So he said, yeah, I got this movie coming up. I want you to meet these producers. I'd love for you to do a draft of it. Um, uh, my buddy's dad had a company and they had a low budget thing. So that was a couple grand. It was really, I mean, networking would be too strong a word. It was just fringe kind of like, you know, find someone that might know someone. It was nothing like today's idea of networking. It was someone I met at a party or I was getting high with, knew somebody who, had a movie, so it was, it was it was stark, man. It was it was lean. The other thing is we sold uh, we sold a horror franchise. Me and a couple of buddies wrote a horror franchise that we sold to Island Pictures back in the day, and that was so little money that that was literally and that's in the book. It was like one year on the clock. Like we sold it to them. One year later, they'd failed to get it done, and back to the drawing board. So it's like these little one year or six month increments, you know, just to keep moving forward. No no glamour. 
no glory, just you know, blue collar grinding. The great thing about that, I will say, is um, having worked at the bottom end of the food chain, and I mean the bottom end of the food chain, um, you develop skills to write quickly um, and accurately, and that ultimately was huge. When it, eventually I got to the Romeo Must Die assignment, I had years of experience doing stuff fast and loose, and so inadvertently that skill set played into me being able to save Romeo in two weeks and get the movie made. So again, not planned, but when you work at that low budget level, I mean I literally wrote, I wrote um, a kickboxing movie for a, at that time a very famous kickboxer in one week for $5,000 and they shot it the next week. So it, it's, it's fast and loose. And you know, this is, this is always my philosophy. If you're going to write a bad movie, write a good bad movie. And we all know what those are. They're the guilty pleasures we love to watch late at night on cable. They're not going to win awards. It's not Citizen Kane. But really have fun with it. And that's always been my approach to action, which is, what would I like to see? Well, I'm a hater, right? When I watch bad action movies, I'm all in their shit. So if, if I was going to rent this movie, I'm being hired to write in one week for five grand, what would be the coolest stuff that I could see? And, and that really helps make those movies fun. Ultimately, the logic may or may not line up, but if as long as it's fun, for five grand, rock and roll, man. Yeah, rock yeah, and roll. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the next section, and you go into um, you know quite a bit in your book just about screenwriting craft. Um, and so I kind of pulled out some questions on craft. The first thing you start with in your chapter, Screenwriting 101, is you literally have these four points. Um, what's the movie? What's the world? Who's the main character? What um, other movies are like? So maybe we could just briefly talk about those four things. And it's, it's curious that you pull those things out um, as because those are like the main, that's the main section of, you know, craft. And correct me if I'm wrong here again, but those are all things you, you are, that really are, are very much geared towards the concept and figuring out before you even start writing yeah. the script. And I think, again, I find a lot of writers, they start writing a screenplay and they haven't gone through those four things. And Blake Snyder, frankly, does a lot of this stuff too. Oh, sure, really, yeah. You're doing a, lot of, doing a lot of prep work before you start writing. So let's just run through those. Right. Maybe by, by the way, I think there's the, the book obviously is not a how-to write book, but it's, it's the big questions and then there's the training day section showing you how precise the note cards need to be. And I thought that was an important balance. You're right, these are kind of the broadest questions you can ask when you start, and strangely, a lot of people don't ask them. And the training day is about you really micromanaging what that script's gonna be. So in terms of these, what's the first one? Um, what's the Just movie? read them off. Yeah, yeah read what's, them. what's the movie? What's the movie? Yeah. Um, you know, it's amazing how many people don't really have an answer to this question. Read the four that I used. Okay, what's the movie? What's the world? Who's the main? Who's your main character, a.k.a. who's the protagonist? What other movies are like your movie? Yeah, these are all elemental because it seems so self-evident. And look, we all like to run before we can walk. Um, it, it's amazing to me, even good writers, how few really come up with answers to these questions. And the ultimate irony is these are the questions, the first questions that come up in a professional environment. Because if they can't answer these questions, they're not going to buy your movie. If they don't know how to market it, if they don't know what it's about, who's it about, um, you're already at, you know, way behind the eight ball. So for me, let me see the list for that. Sure. Okay, so let's just take it from what other movies are like your movie. This is like the simplest trick in the world, um, and it's it's so important. You you For two reasons. One, you need to know the, the ancestors the cinematic ancestors to what you're working on to know what to, to use, what is so obvious if you're stealing it, that you're stealing it, and what to avoid. Um, I find that this is, this is a truism that I heard early in the business and it's never changed, which is if you can't name another movie like your movie, you're fucking up. Because there, you know, there's 36 plots, you're not gonna reinvent the wheel. It's not about totally reinventing the wheel. It's about finding a fresh spin on a version of what's been done before. And so, if you can't name those movies, and it, you'd be stunned in my classes, you'd be shocked how many people, smart, smart people, good writers, really can't find what that is. Now, that means they either haven't thought about it enough or there isn't one, and if there isn't one, you gotta start rethinking. Um, in terms of the character, who's the lead character? I don't think it's ever been more important than it is right now to know who the protagonist is at a really thorough level. And the obvious reason is, 
you need a star, you need a name. The name system now is far more pervasive than it ever was in, in the Hollywood system of the 40s. Um, if you don't have a name, it's gonna be hard to get foreign sales, it's gonna be hard to finance that movie. So that ties in with the idea that movie stars wanna play movie star parts. It seems so self-evident, like we're talking about it, but it's like, you know what? I'd say the number one thing I notice with my students is, um, a certain passivity with their protagonists. Now, you don't want to get carried away with this. You know, you don't want to have the Tom Cruise syndrome where the guy's bulletproof, he can jump off buildings, you know. That, that's just bullshit. But, you'd be shocked. The, the passivity, like they have other characters doing all the cool stuff. Or this, your lead is asking questions all the time instead of making statements, right? Stuff that just weaken, inherently weaken the protagonist. Or they have some character flaw that's you know, just unredeemable. And you're like, dude, nobody wants to play a pedophile. I don't care if he's the coolest pedophile ever. Denzel Washington is not playing the pedophile. So it's stuff like that. You need to know who they are and what they're about um, because movie stars want to play movie star parts. And whoever you are, however smart you are, etc., you're going to need an actor with some bankability to want to do that movie. Yeah. Unknowns are for chumps. These days, you got to have a name. For sure, for sure. Um, so let's talk about what's the world. Maybe you can just give us, because I think that's probably the least obvious of these four points. Yeah, you know, I mean, what is the world? I mean, worlds are something that we kind of take for granted, but really, the, I mean, the, the corollary is essentially take us to a world that we haven't seen before. Now, that doesn't mean a wholly unique world. We've seen police stations before. So what's different about your police station? Um, I would use the shield in television as a great example. Uh, it looked different. It was called the barn. It was, it was an old building that LAPD had restored, so it gave it a very idiosyncratic look, which was different. But also the interplay between, you know, um, the squad, between Vic Mackey's squad and the captain and the other detectives, it re kind of reinvented the contemporary idea of the police station. So, in terms of a world, what is the world, i.e. training day, it's the world of an undercover narc. And what's different or fresh about that? Well, in Training Day, which I covered in you know, extreme detail, you know, I think it was the first time we saw the world of the undercover narc from the inside of the cruiser, essentially, you know, crossing the river Styx inside his G-Ride Monte Carlo and, and focusing it from the in out. That, that was awesome. We've seen it, dude, it's Southern California. I mean, you know, Adam 12, there's been a dragnet, there's been a million helicopters. There were, so what's going to make yours different? And so when it comes to world, you need an interesting world and then you need to, to give it a fresh twist or spin that makes it feel like something new and unique we haven't seen before. And, and it's interesting, when you start looking at movies that way, you start to notice, okay, you know, these are four questions I would urge anyone to ask watching any movie. Yeah, okay, what is the world? Oh, okay, so it's uh, an emergency room and a trauma hospital. Okay, so what's different about that? Who is the protagonist? You should be able to answer these four questions successfully about any movie that you see. And of course, it's got to apply to your movie as well. As I mentioned earlier, the interview with John was nearly three hours long, so I'm going to be um, releasing the next two parts over the next month or so. So keep an eye out for those interviews. A quick plug for my email and fax blast service. I'm running a special right now where you can purchase one third of the blast for a little more than $50. The total list is around 6,000 contacts. So this first one third is about 2,000 contacts. So still a solid number of producers. I've done this just to lower the barrier to entry so that people can check out the blast service without having to invest a whole lot of money up front. The one thing that hasn't changed, I still require that you join SYS Select, which at the time of this recording is just $24.99 per month. The reason I require this as part of the process is that I'm going to personally look at your log line and query letter and help you make them as good as possible. This is this is really for everyone's benefit. I want to make sure that the query letters and log lines are well written before I send them out to my list. The people receiving these email queries can unsubscribe from these blasts. So sending out a bunch of half-baked query letters will just burn the list up, which hurts everyone who might ever want to use this service in the future.
Also, by getting my feedback on your log line and query letter, it means your your response rate is going to be much higher. I've been doing this for a while, and I've had a lot of success from cold query letters. So I think getting my feedback alone is valuable and probably worth the price of admission. You're welcome to join SYS Select for just one month and then quit once your query letter is ready to go. I hope you don't, obviously, but that's totally fine. Um, and once you once your query letter is approved by me, you're free to buy the other blasts later on, even if you're no longer a member of SYS Select. You don't have to rejoin down the road to send the same query letter out. It really is just to get your letter and log line into shape. Also, lots of people have joined SYS Select just to get my input on their log line or query letter. So you're more than welcome to join even if you don't want to use my BLAST service. Also, I just want to talk about a few of the other SYS Select benefits. Um, by joining SYS Select, you get access to the SYS Select forum. In the forum, I've reviewed hundreds of query letters and log lines, and you can see my notes on the revisions and the revisions that the writers made. So this is a great resource just to help you write your own log lines and query letter. You also get access to all um, the online SYS Select classes that have been done over the last couple of years. There are more than a dozen classes covering all sorts of screenwriting topics from writing your script to pitching your script to writing and producing short films. Um, I teach a lot of them. There's other, some other people have taught some of the other classes as well. It's a great resource for any writer who wants to further their screenwriting education. I also get this question, how long will the sale be going on? And I honestly don't know. If it seems to be working well, I'll probably keep it going for a while. But if it just ends up being a ton more work, I'll probably just go back and, and make people buy the entire Blast in one big purchase. So the one-third Blast plus one month of SYS Select is just $78. And that's a Blast to more than 2,000 industry producers. It's really never going to get any cheaper than that. So if you ever wanted to try out my Blast service, this is a good time to do it. To check this out or to sign up for SYS Select, just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash blast. You can learn more about the blast service. If you want to sign up for SYS Select, just go to sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. Anyways, the blast again, the blast service can be found at sellingyourscreenplay.com slash blast. In the next episode of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast, I'm going to be interviewing screenwriter and actor Tim Ogletree about his latest film, The Walking Deceased, which is a low-budget zombie comedy that he also helped produce. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. I just want to touch on a couple of things from today's segment. I don't want to dwell on the negative, but I think knowing what you're up against is very, very important. And, you know, a lot of the questions and a lot of what John talked about today was just those seven years of struggle. And I and as I mentioned to him in the interview, and and I think a lot of people feel like, you know, things are smooth sailing once you get that agent and that life will be good once you get that first sale. And that's not really the case. Really, it's um, it's a long, long road. And, and that's really only the beginning, beginning of a, of a very long road. So I hope this comes across as inspirational and positive, because, as I said, I'm not trying to dwell on the negative. But I think it's important people kind of know what they're up against. I actually think that gives you a better chance of success. I mean, if you feel like you're just going to come out to Hollywood, sell a script in six months, your career is going to be up and running. It's a little unrealistic. And I think if you come with those expectations and then that doesn't happen, you're, you're more likely to get really discouraged. So I think that there is some, you know, importance in kind of understanding what it's really going to be like. And, you know, listen to what John just said. I mean, he was really persistent. I mean, he literally devoted his life to becoming a successful screenwriter. He stayed in a small apartment. He didn't upscale his life. Um, you know, he really didn't have any backup plan. He just invested everything in it. And and sometimes that's what it takes. Um, it, it can be just a, a brutal struggle for many, many years. And, you know, I think, too, he it took his struggle, looked like it was about seven years, but um, he actually arrived in L.A. with an agent. So I think in a lot of ways he was ahead of people right as he drove into LA he was actually ahead of the game so you know it could take longer than seven years um, it could take you a few years just to get to the point where you have an agent and and get an option um, so as I said I don't like to dwell on the negative um, I know a lot of people don't necessarily want to hear that but um, I think it's important I think understanding what you're up against can really help you succeed it can help you with your expectations you know come out to LA and, and be ready for the long haul um, get yourself in a situation 
information so that you can stay out here for more than a year, more than two years. You can stay out here for, for the rest of your life if that's what it takes. Um, I think LA is a great place. I mean, there's a lot of opportunities, not just in the entertainment industry, but in all facets. Um, so no matter what your job is, um, you can probably find a similar job in LA and, and you can find a nice place to live and you can find nice friends and, and set yourself up for sort of the long haul. And I think you'll be in much, much better shape. I think you'll have a much better chance of success than, you know, saving a bunch of money coming out for six months, a year, writing, going through your savings and then having to pack up and go home. And I've been out here for many, many years and I've seen that a lot. You know, there's a lot of people that come out here and there seems to be that like, you know, two year to five year window where if people don't make it, they kind of pack up and go home and, and, you know, just listen to John's story. It took him more than five years to really get a foothold in the industry. And, um, he's a really smart guy and he worked really hard and he's really persistent. So, you know, if you think you're going to do better than that, um, it's going to require a lot of luck and you just really can't count on that. Anyway, that's the show. Thank you for listening.